So today I'm in conversation with uh, Remy Ngamije. Remy is a Rwandan born Namibian writer and photographer. He is the founder and chairperson as well as administrator of Duke, an independent arts organization in Namibia supporting the literary arts. He is also the co-founder and editor in chief of Duke Literary Magazine, Namibia's first and only literary magazine. His debut novel, The Eternal Audience of One, is available from Scout Press. His work has appeared in Granta, One Story, Lolwi, the Johannesburg Review of Books, and many other places. He won the Africa Regional Prize of the 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. He was shortlisted for the ACO Kane Prize for the African Writing for African writing in 2020 and 2021. He was also long listed and shortlisted for the 2020 and 2021 Afri Tondo short story prizes respectively. In 2019, he was shortlisted for the best original fiction by stock magazines. More of his writing can be read on his website. Remy, welcome to this brief chat. How are you doing? I am all right, Sam, and yourself? I'm doing well. Um, Remy, good, I met good. you some uh, few years ago. 2018. 2018, and uh, from no, what no, I No, 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 2017. 2017. From what I recall, yeah. you were like a school teacher that time? Yeah, I was teaching high school English at Vintok High School here in Vintok in Namibia, teaching grade 8, 9, and 10. Quite interesting. And uh, you had uh, the generosity of sharing with me a manuscript then, which was quite huge. A terrible, a terrible manuscript, a terrible thing that was too long, too, too long. I can't believe I, I can't believe I sent that thing to you. You should have deleted it upon receipt. <laughs> it was not less than 250,000 words, about 700. It was too much. <laughs> it was too much. It was way, way too much. Uh, again, I can only apologize in retrospect for sending you something that long. It was absolutely ridiculous. Um, but I've gotten better with time. I've learned a lot. I have learned a lot. I'm glad that uh, the novel is finally published and there is wider acclaim. There's a lot of uh, international acclaim on that work. Thank so briefly, you. Thank really, you. would you share how and when you're writing journey started? Uh, it starts always in, high, in primary school for me. I, I tell people all the time that I've enjoyed writing for a long time and my skill at writing really commenced in primary school. Um, why? Because that's when I was learning English and that's when I was learning how to write, how to communicate with people. Um, and so it, it stretches all the way back to the second grade but if you're asking about my professional writing career, about when I wanted to become a writer and when I started doing the things that it takes to start getting published, I would say that would have been in university when I joined the UCT student newspaper in Cape Town. And that was my first taste of writing for a larger and wider audience. Um, and that's really where I guess I joined the publishing world through student journalism. Um, that's really, I think I'll break my writing career into two part, into three parts. So one would be primary and high school when I was learning how to learn, when I was learning how to write and then university when I was first learning how to write for an audience. And then the third stage would be the stage I'm in now, which is writing with the intention of publishing and sharing with a wider and at times unknown audience. Quite interesting. What have been the challenges and highlights? What has been the journey like? Uh, the challenges are all the challenges I think every writer faces in the world. Uh, how to make this career that you want or like so much provide or sustain you. Um, that's a challenge that I haven't yet figured out how to live purely by writing alone. There's only a handful of writers in the world who can claim that privilege and I'm not one of them so I'm still learning that's a challenge every writer faces um, again time is a big challenge writing takes time editing takes time reading takes time 
So becoming good at what you're doing really does take a lot of your time. Um, personal motivation, I guess. Um, writing despite challenges that you might face in your personal life. Uh, because everything that you endure as a writer shapes you in some way. So personal motivation is a very big thing. Overcoming disappointment is a big challenge um, and still carrying on regardless. That's a very, very big one. Uh, something you can't write when you're, when you're emotional, when you are uh, not right, when you don't feel okay with anything. Uh, so those things affect you. Uh, but so personal motivation will be a big thing. And then I think the last one would probably be having the courage to write the story or the vision that is in your head. That's a very big one as well to overcome. Uh, not only me, but every writer faces that. And then the journey so far has been educational for me. Um, I am a student in this craft. I learn every day. I try to learn every week. Um, and I've got, I've got, uh, despite everything, I feel like I'm always just starting out. And I like that feeling because it always brings me back to the basics, always brings me back to um, a fresh starting point. Um, and so the journey for me has been very wonderful and very educational. Yeah. Was it easy finally getting a publisher, especially for your debut novel? What was that experience like? <laughs> uh, it was terrible. First of all, uh, I submitted it to a lot of publishers and then it was rejected all over the, all over in a lot of places in a lot of countries on at least three continents. Uh, it was very disappointing, very discouraging, but I had to stick it out. I had to ride the wave of disappointment and hope that somebody would pick it up somewhere. And by luck, and thank God, I did find a publisher in South Africa, uh, Blackbird Books, who took it on the first time. We went through a series of rounds of editing it, whittling it down, making sure that it was within publishable length. Um, and then in the end, when I look back on the journey, it seems easy, but I know when, it was, when I was going through it, it was not easy finding a publisher. And so to anybody who is putting out work and hoping to be published, I think you need to be more realistic about your timelines because publishing is a very slow industry. You can't uh, say I must have found a publisher by January. It's not always guaranteed. So I learned a lot of patience through, during that process. Yeah, a lot of patience. Interesting. Do you have a copy of the eternal audience of wine with you there? Because uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going yeah. to ask you to tell me a bit about it. You might actually, I mean, I hope if it is close by, you can just pick it and maybe yeah, just show some I can. viewers. Definitely, I can definitely get it for you. Yeah, let me just move towards my bookshelf and reach out for it. There we go. So yeah, no, I have it. And it's, um, I always look back at this thing and wonder how the heck it became possible in the first place. Here we go. This is my this is my copy. This is the one I keep in the house. And it's got a lot of it's got a lot of uh, marks in it um, about things that I always come back to and revisit and think about. Yeah. Um, what is the pagination now finally? How many pages is that book? Because that book, uh, <laughs> the original one should have been 700 or 800 pages. No, 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 no. There was no way they were going to publish a 700 page book. This one is 506. The American edition is shorter. It is three, four, four something. Um, so it's gone through in various stages of its life. It's, it's gone through a lot of trimming, losing a lot of weight <laughs> along the way. <laughs> Tell us a bit about yeah. what inspired that book, uh, that novel specifically, and what it is all about. I can just say it's a work uh, of fiction, but uh, give us a bit of some insights yeah. as the author. Yeah, it's a, it's it's about a, a young man called Seraphin who is facing his final year of graduation. He is very anxious about the world and what his place in it will be. He's directionless for the most part. And he's a Rwandan living in Vintuk in Namibia, a very challenging place to live if you're an immigrant. 
whether you're an immigrant, migrant, refugee, expat, whatever, um, all of these terms are explored within the context of the story, but he identifies as an immigrant. And so it's a very tough place to be a black African immigrant living in Vintook, trying to find your place in the world. And it explores not only his life, but his family's life, their migration from Rwanda in 1994, and then also to some extent his parents' young life when they were still coming of age. And it follows Seraphine and a host of characters as through the course of this year on the way to graduation and the challenges he faces, not only in Vintook, but at his university in Cape Town um, with his friends, with fitting into a city like Cape Town that has a lot of political, social and economic um, challenges. Um, and so it explores his journey in his final year. But more than that, I think it's just a story about migration, about people trying to fit in wherever they can, however they can. It is a, it's a story about, I think, making a living, um, trying to make a living, trying to find community, trying to find love, trying to find security, stability, all of these things that a lot of people take for granted when they are native to a place. But when you are an immigrant, these things are not so easy to come by. And so I think for me personally, that's what the novel explores. And it does it with some, you know, there's some funny and humorous bits in the, in the narrative, but there are some parts that require or request the reader rather to think about what it is that is lost when you leave home and what it is that you gain when you land somewhere else and you really do try to make a home. It's um. It's a challenging narrative in that respect in many ways, but it offers a lot of diverse, I think, views and emotions uh, through this young man's journey, yeah. Quite interesting. I'm curious, uh, Remy, uh, is there part of you in that book as well? <laughs> um, <laughs> is there some element the, of biography? The text, is there part of yeah, you? Yeah, the, 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 the textbook answer that I give is always that, some of it, all of it is biographical, some of it is biographical, and none of it is biographical. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because anybody who makes something, whether it is a potter, whether it is a steel worker, whether it is a baker, whether it is a bricklayer, anybody who makes something, even a parent, anybody who makes something else, there's always a little bit of them in that thing. And so my my answer is always that you know sometimes the baker's sweat gets into the bread. <laughs> Quite interesting here, and uh, <laughs> um, then um, I have uh, read a number of reviews about your first novel, mm. the eternal audience mm. of one, and even read something to the effect that uh, there might be some direction towards translations, etc. How mm. is that mm. bearing on you? How are you? Um, receiving that type of international acclaim, what is it having no. as an effect on you? No, no, it doesn't really have an effect on me. What, I, what, I, what I've personally come to realize as a writer is all of this acknowledgement that you might get with your work, all of it that um, whatever praise you get, whether it is criticism or praise, all of it really is designed to challenge you. So the best I can answer is that a negative review is there to challenge you in a way you're either going to be shaped negatively by it or you're going to respond positively to it. The same thing with praise, you're either going to wind up becoming proud and arrogant or you're going to take it as an acknowledgement, a third party acknowledgement of work that you have done. And that is going to either, it's, you'll either take it as encouragement for continuing to work, um, or if you'll take it as pride and it'll ultimately stop you from continuing your work. For me, all of these things are the, the international acclaim, the, the short listings, potential translations, all of these things for me, I relate them not to me personally, but to the work that was done. And so I really am divorced from the book. I don't necessarily think of the praise as praise for me, but I think it is praise for the work because I also do maintain a healthy distance from 
the work that I do. I try to distance myself from it. And so all of these accolades, whatever, they help the work to go further. I don't necessarily go further. Uh, I don't, or rather, I feel like I don't necessarily, when people say Remy's book, they, they literally mean Remy's book, not Remy. Um, and so those, maintaining that relationship with my work allows me to be a little distant from whatever is third party because I cannot control those things. Those things are way, way out of my control. What I can control are how much time I can dedicate to my writing and how driven I am to be better, if that makes sense. Yeah. From your profile, Remy, I understand mm. that you are also into short story writing and uh, mm. what inspired mm. that and how do you go about it? Short stories are awesome. They're a very challenging medium to get involved in. But when you get them right, when you do the work correctly, they can be so, so rewarding. And what I enjoy about short stories is that they're a, you deal with a shorter narrative, not necessarily a shorter length of time, but you deal with a story that you can tell someone in one go, in one sitting, whereas a novel is a little more drawn out. Um, how I got into it was just, I think my drive towards short storytelling was because I needed to build a literary profile for myself. When the novel was accepted for publication, I didn't have anything to my name. I didn't have anything that said his work has appeared here, here, and elsewhere. Those things are important in the literary community and I didn't have them. So I had to literally go out in the world, write short stories, try and get them published in, published in as many places as possible to try and build this portfolio of work for myself. But I still enjoy short story writing because it is such a challenging medium of storytelling. But when you get it right, it is so, so wonderful. And the best part about short stories is finding ordinary tales that people tell you or that you hear in a taxi or that you hear in a shop or that you hear over the phone, you hear in gossip, it's, and then finding some way to put that on the page. That for me is the most wonderful part of the storytelling experience when it comes to short stories. Mm. And uh, Remy, you're the founder of Duke. Tell us a bit about mm. Duke, because when I heard that name, of course, I thought yeah. of this head cover that is put on by Yeah, Remy. yeah. Uh, yeah, tell yeah. me a bit more and, about Duke. <laughs> and Duke is, it is exactly that. It is, um, it is a reference to the headdress that, you know, people on the continent or elsewhere or elsewhere wear. It's a scarf for a head wrap. But it's also the last phonetic sound in Vintuk. So Vinduk, Duk also riffs on that. Um, but it is a multi-faceted arts organization that publishes the literary magazine for the first thing. Um, and then it also hosts creative writing workshops. It tries to um, support the literary arts within the Duk ecosystem. Um, we are trying very hard to grow our own internal resources so that we can further develop Namibian uh, creative writing and storytelling. Um, and it's, you know, we, we work a lot with re local, regional and national and international partners to get Namibian and African writing out in the world, which is, I think, the most important part of the mission that no local writing here from the country is transported not only around the country, but outside of it into into Africa and into all, to try and create a literary tradition and a literary community of local, national and international readers. So that's what Duke does in a nutshell, but the nitty gritty of it on a daily basis, I am always involved with administration, dealing with donors and fundraising, uh, editing, trying to get writers to submit, planning, scheduling, editing, copy editing, proofreading, and finally releasing each issue of Duke Literary Magazine, um, organizing creative writing workshops, uh, with the Literary Awards that, that just happened this year, uh, liaising with Bank Vinto to make sure that, you know, for example, everybody's expectations are met and that, you know, that the awards happen in a fair, just and equitable manner and in a transparent way. And then, you know, look after the, the lifeblood and the longevity of this young 
ambitious arts organization. Um, it's a very challenging endeavor, but it is something that I find very, very rewarding. Um, just a bit of uh, some uh, question here. You studied yeah. law. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it seems you are fully occupied by Duke and writing and other things <laughs> now. How has that been yeah. received by your inner circle from family and the people who know you, your yeah, former yeah. classmates, etc.? No, everybody, everybody who knows me knows that, you know, I did English literature first and then I studied law and I finished and everything else. But everybody who knows me always knew that I gravitated towards other interests. Now that I do, now that I, with the work that I do with Duke, I actually find myself relying on that law education more often than not. A lot of work, a lot of business is, const is, is contractual. A lot of it deals with you know, who is responsible for this and who is responsible for that. A lot of things deal with legal obligation. Um, and so our business models, DOC, um, the organization, it has a trust in it and it has a CC in it and it deals with, you know, it, it, although we are designed to facilitate literature in Namibia, mm -hmm. we have legal entities that need to function in a particular way. And so I find myself actually relying on that legal education in a way that I did not anticipate. My family obviously supported very, very strongly. They always support my general happiness, however that may be. Would they have been happy that I had become a lawyer? Of course they would have, because that would have made me happy. But are they also equally happy that this other avenue has materialized in my life? Yes. Um, and it is something that a lot of people do not have that they do not have the support of their friends or family or their local community or, or an industry. And I can honestly say that I've been supported in a lot of ways by my family because um, they understood the reason for the change, but only now later, I think, are they starting to see the greater vision. So things that we spoke about that might not have been clear in 2013 when I changed direction, suddenly makes sense in 2021. So it's been like a long journey with everybody concerned. Now everything seems to make sense. Back then it, it didn't, but I was, I was very fortunate to be given trust and to be given space and time to pursue this thing, yeah. In other words, uh, you are living off writing and uh, the literary world? <laughs> no, I am not living off writing. My brother, we have to make a living somehow, somewhere in the moon, and it is a very challenging place. So writing is only one thing. Um, you do a lot of other uh, tertiary activities to make sure that, you know, there's a roof over your head, that there's food in the fridge, and then there's water and electricity. So I work other things. I, I do other things in order to keep to provide myself with the means to continue writing. Like I said, there's only a handful of writers in the world who can afford to live off their writing exclusively. And I need to be honest and say that I am not one of them. Um, so work for me not only involves getting to other aspects of writing, like my creative writing, but it also actively involves seeking out other economic opportunities to continue providing for myself and for my life. This is a reality that a lot of writers face. Uh, I am not unique. This struggle is not unique to me. Everybody that I know is involved in this. Uh, and so I have to, you know, I respect a lot of people who are involved in the arts. The arts are not necessarily always a self-sustaining uh, industry so a lot of a lot of artists have other jobs they do other things and i am not exempt from this all right maybe you're not yeah. living off writing yet <laughs> the hope yet. the hope and the dream the hope <laughs> and the dream but uh we work we work towards these things slowly uh and you know you have to pursue it in a way that doesn't disappoint you if it doesn't materialize um, you have, to, you have to accept this artistic struggle with a measure of grace and patience. If so it materializes, good for you. Sometimes yeah. managing expectations. 
Yeah, yeah. If it if it materializes, good. Be thankful and work hard to secure it and maintain it. If it doesn't, be kind and patient with yourself. Great. Yeah. As we are uh, winding up, uh, Remy, yeah. um, any words to aspiring and discouraged writers? <laughs> you have gone through that oh, journey man. that you have described. You I am. I am still an. Ass- I am still an aspiring and I am still a very discouraged writer, Sam. Um, (laughs) And so my advice to anybody else in this field is try, 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 try. And then also most importantly, even after you do try, whatever it is that you're doing, whether it is fiction, nonfiction, poetry, visual art, screenplays, theater, whatever it is that you're doing, you first have to try. And then the second part of it, the hardest part, is you always have to also try to carry on. It is, it is very, very challenging. Um, this industry, the arts, whatever you're doing, and I say this not only whether you're, you're a writer, but also whether you're an actor, whether you're a play, whether you're in theater, whether you're a musician, whether you're a sculptor, whether you're a painter, a career in the arts is always going to be challenging. But the first role of the artist is to try and bring their vision that is in their head, in their soul, in their heart, try and bring it into reality. And then once it's been brought into reality, to try and turn that reality to some sort of remuneration or survival for themselves. And that's why I say I am also equally aspiring as the next writer, and I am as discouraged as the next writer, because the challenges that I face are the same challenges that everybody else will face, but you still have to try. You still have to try and carry on. And I think those two things um, are the, are not only the things that I tell myself in the morning when I wake up, but they're also the things I tell myself at night just before I go to bed. Um, And they're things, they're compass points that keep me aspiring as well despite the discouragement and disappointments yeah. interesting and uh Remy, <laughs> tell me something you want to write a short yeah. story how do you go yeah. about it tell me you know you have written a number of short stories you have uh, <laughs> what how do you go about writing a typical yeah. short story what me, do you do? the simplest do you just my simple yeah my simplest method is i think of a a, a one-liner description of the story so let's say it is a story about a Wednesday morning inventor. That is the story. It is only about a Wednesday morning inventor. The reason why I say summarize it in one line is because it gives you a nice, well-defined scope. We're not writing about Wednesday afternoon. We're not writing about Wednesday evening. It must be Wednesday morning. So clearly defined length of time or narrative, if you want to say. Then I usually plot point. Um, I say Wednesday morning, break it up into eight o'clock, 10 o'clock, and then 11.30, 11.45, whatever. Break it into segments. What happens? Plot points. Uh, it is always useful to find a conflict or a drama or something that a character wants, but they cannot have and how they're going to try and get it. Um, that will, for example, if you say it's about a Wednesday morning, then there's a lot of impetus or need for this character to get what they want before it's Wednesday afternoon, because by then it's too late. Um, So that scope really creates a a pressure cooker of expectations, of desire, of attempts and of failure as well. Then uh, you sit down and you write a short story. I think if it is a short story, you should be able to produce a draft for it in one sitting. By one sitting, I mean it is either 30 minutes, two hours, three hours, four hours, whatever. But you can produce a draft for the short story within a, a limited amount of time. Now, just because it's been produced in a limited amount of time doesn't mean that, that it's done. The revision part can take a day, can take a week, can take a month, can even take a year. And so that revision process of refining this Wednesday morning, making sure that it is believable, that the language is good, that the characters are believable, that takes a lot of time. And that is where I think all the good short story writers spend a lot of their time. So that first draft is very, not very easy to produce, but it can be done and it can be done relatively quickly, quickly, much quicker than one can produce a novel. 
once you've got that, you've got your plot, you've got your story, you've got your characters. Um, I think a great title is absolutely important for, um, for a short story. I think short stories must have very, very good titles because there are so many of them and they're all competing for attention. So I think a good title is always important. And then lastly, once you've produced said short story, everything, the words are on paper, it is always good to have someone read it and tell you, hmm, I felt this, I think this was okay, I think yada, yada, yada. And then, you know, as a writer, you take those, that feedback on board. There's some things that are gonna be useful for you and there's some things that won't be useful. And it's uh, up to the individual to gauge which is constructive and which is not important. And so that's how I go about my process. Uh, I think about a narrative that can be relatively short. I sit down and write it as quickly as I can. Once I've got that draft, then it's a matter of taking my time with it. It might become longer, but most of the time it, it might become, first it becomes short, then it becomes long, then it becomes shorter. And then once it's become shorter, then you know you've got a short story, yeah. <laughs> in the next uh, two to three minutes, Remy, uh, yeah. who have been some of your best authors, maybe just the top three or so, and uh, any Ooh. other works in the pipeline, especially a novel, anything that you're Yo. working on currently? <laughs> <laughs> what I am working on right now, my dearest brother, is uh, surviving this pandemic. Eh? I think that is my full-time occupation, but I have ambitions of putting out another novel, of sitting down and making the time to write. That takes a lot of time. And so I am preparing my schedule, not only for this year, but for 2022 to commit to a long narrative. My favorite writer of the moment is the one and only Titi Dangarengba, who wrote Nervous Conditions, This Mournable Body and the Book of Not. I recently reread Nervous Conditions and I am amazed by how amazing that book is. And it's incredible that Titi also had a struggle, a long struggle to bring that book to the world. Um, and only now is, is this amazing storyteller and the work that she's doing and done finally getting recognition. And so she's a lot older now, but her, her work, it's, it's not timeless in the sense that it is not affected by time, but it is very timely in the sense that whether you read it in one year or two years time, it always has this sense of urgency and immediacy to it. And so for me, Titi Dagaremba right now is the author that I would say, I have not only reread Nervous Conditions, but the Book of Not and This Mournable Body. Amazing stories, amazing writing, amazing dedication to the craft. And for me, remember what I said about try and trying, I think Titi, for me represents that because she's been doing this for many years and she's still pushing aggressively with determination, with perseverance, and most importantly, with the hardest thing of all, with grace, with grace. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, in just uh, 20 seconds, Remy, where do yeah. people get your book, uh, especially the okay. novel? novel. Uh, yeah. Tell us where it can be obtained from. Yeah, we so can... the eternal audience of one, if you're in Vintuk, it's available at the Book Den in Vintuk West. Uh, if you're somewhere else in Sadek, you can always get it at any exclusive books. If you're abroad, if you're in the US, if you're in the UK or elsewhere in the world, any fine retailer will be able to provide you with a copy. The Audible is the audio book is also available on Audible, and so is the ebook on Amazon. So wherever you get your literary fix, you should be able to find a copy of this. My other short stories are curated on my website, remythequill.com, but they have also av they're available in various anthologies. And so if you go to your local bookshop and you ask them, for example, the Afritondo short story collections, they should be able to put you in connect in, co in connection with those books. Yeah. Thank you so much, Remy, for the time. It has been great. Thanks so much for your time. Sam, thank you so much for making the space on the platform. It's important uh, to acknowledge your part in this as well. Um, people who provide platforms for writers to share their work with the readers are equally as important as the readers and the writers. So thank you for making the time as well, man.
Great. Thank you so much.